My name is Matt Colton and I'm a mastering engineer and I work at a studio called Air Studios in London. I'm here to contradict everything that George said this morning. I think that's actually quite important that there isn't ever just one right way of doing things and we're all offering opinions and if you guys get to hear as many opinions as possible then you can choose to agree with some bits that someone said and some bits that someone else said and that way you learn and find your own way and form your own style and ways of working. For me as a mastering engineer, although I still cut a lot of vinyl, obviously I'm working to CD format, I'm doing a lot of stuff that is only ever going to be downloaded as a digital file, but still understanding what I know about vinyl and vinyl cutting um, underpins everything that I do. The original mastering engineers were actually the original recording engineers. The early recordings were made on 78 RPM discs, and you'd have a band in a room with a mic, or possibly two mics if it was a really high budget recording, and they'd record straight to disc. And so the lathe operator would start the cut, cue the band, they'd play, and you'd hope that they finished the song before you ran out of disc space. Um, if you wanted to bring something forward in the mix, you know, the trumpet solo, the trumpeter would just have to get closer to the mic. The advent of tape in the recording studio meant that you could do a lot more in recording, but they still needed a way to get the music to the public to sell, and the public still needed it on disc. That's what the public bought. So this is really where the mastering engineer was born, and... Originally, the mastering engineer would be just doing a flat transfer from the tape to the disc. Obviously, as equipment evolved and developed, um, the mastering engineer started to get his hands on some very, very basic tools that could adjust the sound and began to equalise the sound from the tape because a recording on tape will sound different when it's transferred to a vinyl disc. For me, mastering is a, it's a nice combination of technical and creative. Obviously, we're creating the thing that goes to the factory and then gets turned into a thousand copies or ten thousand copies or a million copies. If you cock it up, the record label has now got ten thousand copies of something that they can't sell. In the mastering room, we need to have the best acoustic environment possible. I'd much rather work in a great acoustic space with good speakers and a couple of plugins than I would a poor acoustic space with poor monitoring and all the equipment that anyone has ever created because I know I would make better masters there. This is a picture of a Neumann VMS 80 and this is my current lathe at the minute. If we take, a, take an album, that's the available recording space there. And when we cut a record, we're effectively just cutting waveforms onto the disc. Now, what you all know, I'm sure, is that high-frequency waveforms make small movements and low-frequency waveforms make big movements. So by cutting a lot of the bottom end out, we obviously reduce those big movements, which are going to take up more space on the disc, it enables us to fit more music on. So the cutter head itself is this black triangular thing with a yellow, smaller triangle in it. So when we're cutting a record, obviously the record is spinning. You lower the head into the uh, blank lacquer and it will start to cut a groove. The head is propelled across the surface of the disc, so the groove cuts from the outside to the inside. But all the while the stylus is swinging about and so the groove modulates from side to side. And in very basic terms, when we play it back, we drop the playback stylus into it, which rides the groove and therefore that stylus wobbles about from side to side, and the opposite process happens, creates a signal which is then converted into music, and sounds in some way similar to the music that we recorded in the first place. Um, I say it sounds in some way similar because it will never sound exactly the same. It's not actually possible to have it sound exactly the same. So part of the skill of the cutting engineer is to understand how the sound will change and work with that. One thing that baffled me before I got into this was exactly how you get stereo. And the way they do it is 
the 45-45 degree system. So the left-hand channel is represented by one slanted wall of the groove and the right-hand channel by the other. And when a big moment of stereo-ness happens in the recording, what will happen is the groove will actually get deeper. As a totally mono thing happens, the groove gets shallower. So you've got the lateral movement from side to side, which is giving you frequency, and then you've actually got a vertical movement as well, which is giving you stereo information. The cutting stylus itself sadly isn't made of diamond. They are grown in factories, uh, industrially manufactured sapphire. And you can see here the cutting tip itself is actually a V-shaped cut. One of the later developments in vinyl cutting was what's called variable pitch. Those squiggly lines, they effectively represent grooves. And you can see the minimum distance that needs to be maintained. What variable pitch did was um, we sent two feeds to the lathe. So we sent a feed that went to the lathe cutting computer, and that is sent in advance of the actual feed, which is the audio signal that is cut. It means the lathe knows what's coming. So if it can see that in the next groove, all it needs, there's not much happening, it's a little quiet section, a little bit of piano and vocal, it knows that it can squish up the land between the grooves. Then when the big bass drum, you know, bass line comes in and it all gets very, very loud, it can see that coming and it can open it up. And what it means is you're much less likely to have groove collisions. So variable pitch cutting um, enabled cutting engineers to cut louder sides or longer sides or more bass. So this is kind of what a record looks like when we look at the grooves close up. And that white line across it is a human hair. So at a factory stage, they'll take the lacquer they put it into a bath of uh, like a nickel alloy and apply an electrical charge to it, which draws it onto the lacquer. They peel that off. And they then have um, like a foil-type material, which is an opposite of the lacquer that we've cut. So it has ridges. They then do the same thing again, peel that off, and they then have the metalwork, um, which is like the lacquer, has grooves. You can play metalwork. They then have to do it again, and they then create something called the stamper which again has ridges instead of grooves. You get a stamper for the A side, a stamper for the B side, blob of vinyl in the middle, press a record. But obviously all these chemical industrial processes add a certain amount of noise to it. Um, the better factories tend to make less noise on a record. If you're ever gonna press a record, my advice, if you care about the quality of the sound, spend as much as you can on manufacturing and you are more likely to get a better sounding record. So earlier I said that when you play a record back, it will never sound exactly as how it was cut. Part of the reason is um, you can't play it back with a V-shaped stylus, so you can never fully replicate the actual cutting. Um, if we look at a DJ kind of stylus, it will be a spherical stylus like this one, and you can see how it sits in the groove. It can't possibly get right down into the bottom of the groove. It's not possible. An elliptical stylus is more like what you'd find on a hi-fi or an audiophile um, cartridge, and you can see that that rides the groove much better, but even so, we still can't get right down into the very bottom of the groove. You can see here, these two grooves have completely collided, and that will almost certainly jump. Vinyl is one of the highest resolution formats, so if you're doing a mix, you've recorded, you've tracked, and you've mixed at 96K or something like this, 88, when the consumer buys it, if they're buying the digital product, CD, 44.1, MP3, obviously degraded further from there. With vinyl, we can actually cut from the high-resolution files. So if I play you uh, a track which we've mastered, again, this is my CD master now. Um, so it's been through the digital limiting. Obviously, I've turned it down. Um, if I just play you this, so the CD version, first of all. There's a limit to your love. When we mastered it, uh, he brought in files from Logic and I mastered it in analogue and I captured at 176.4. Um, I really went to town on the sample rates on this one. Um, and I cut the vinyl from those 176.4k captures. I think it certainly delivers again a more natural sound, more depth in the mix and just feels a bit nicer. So, 
hopefully you can even feel the difference on, on a track like this. Uh, no. Um, again, if you've got a great acoustic space, if you're hearing as much of what's been recorded as possible and you're having as little influence from the acoustic space that you're in as possible, then the decisions that you make are going to be as close to what is right as possible. What I do do frequently, if I've done an album or something, is I will just scrunch out some mp3s, stick it on the mp3 player and then if you know when I'm getting the tube home or something just have it on in the headphones and do you know maybe like a a different kind of listening there and if something leaps out at me maybe I'll learn something about it which I can then go back to the mastering studio see does it feel like that here do you know what I mean are you coming up well, I've got my yeah yeah do do Mm -hmm. I think a lot of DJs do just press the mono button in when they turn on their preamps very often. And it also relates to your point about spatial enhancers, because most of those work by putting things a bit out of phase. Yeah, yeah. That's why I always used to hate all those yes. kind of cue sound and all those yeah, things yeah. that gave you pseudo extra wide stereo, because they do just completely disappear in mono. Mm. My advice, yeah, would simply be work out, you know, if it's a piece of electronica that is to be enjoyed you know, at home, on the headphones or, you know, on the stereo at home, then, yeah, you can really enjoy the full stereo experience. If it's, you know, just a banging piece of techno, then make sure it's still banging in mono.